everyone. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empower Neurologist. You know, in the name The Empower Neurologist, you would think that we would be talking a bit about neurological problems, and that is a, certainly a recurrent theme, and today is no different. We're going to be talking today about Alzheimer's. That's a disease diagnosed in close to 5.8 million Americans. It is a disease for which we have no meaningful treatment whatsoever in terms of pharmacology, in terms of pharmaceutical intervention. But a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Dale Bredesen, and he wrote this book, The End of Alzheimer's, that went on to become a New York Times bestseller, being translated in languages around the world. Why? Because he challenged the mainstream. He challenged the mainstream's idea that we have to treat a disease with a drug, and he created a program that looked at leveraging multiple inputs as many as uh, 36 different ideas uh, to bring to bear against this progressive disease, uh, Alzheimer's, and he has had great success uh, in so doing. Uh, Dr. Bredesen lectures around the world. He teaches uh, doctors how to implement his program around the world, and he has a new book out. The new book is called The End of Alzheimer's Program, The First Protocol to Enhance Cognition and Reverse Decline at Any Age. That's exciting. Let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Bredesen. Uh, again, he's internationally recognized. He's an expert in the understanding and even in the teaching of the mechanisms underlying the degeneration of the brain uh, that occurs in things like Alzheimer's. Uh, again, his book back in 2017 was a New York Times bestseller. Dr. Bredesen has held faculty positions, really prestigious uh, faculty positions at UCSF, UCLA, uh, University of California, uh, San Diego, and directed the program of aging at the Burnham Institute before he then went to the Buck Institute in 1998 as its founding president and CEO. Uh, he is currently a professor at UCLA. Uh, I had the opportunity to lecture with Dr. Bredesen at the uh, Buck Institute, uh, as well as many other uh, opportunities that, uh, to lecture with him uh, in uh, conferences uh, around the country. So we're really looking forward today to talking about his new book and also thinking back over the past couple of years, what has he learned? Uh, what has proven successful? How does that success actually look in terms of numbers? And where do we go from here? Well, hello, Dr. Dale Bredesen. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. I hope you're staying safe, you and the family, David. Yeah, I was, uh, before we went, uh, we hit the record button, I was commenting on the hair. It looks really good on you. You know, we got to get the band back together, I think. Yeah, really. It's, it's uh, longer than it's been since high school, so it's uh, time to get it cut for sure. Well, there you go. So we have uh, talked about the end of Alzheimer's before. Now, your new book, uh, what's the main difference in terms of what you're talking about? Right. So the first book was about the theory and about, you know, for the first time we can actually think about doing this and think about what drives the degenerative process. Many people said, we want more details. We need, where do we go? How do we do this? What are the pitfalls, et cetera? So we have a, a wonderful and kind of unique triad here with uh, Julie, who's a person who's been doing this, a patient who's been doing this for eight years, who contributed to this book, uh, as well as my wife, Aida, who, who is a clinician and myself as the scientist. So we really have a triad that kind of gives a unique look at how to do it, where to do it, what are the pitfalls, where do you go, what are the websites you need to know about, what are the products you need to know about, all that. So it is, it's the program that goes with the first book, which is why it's called The End of Alzheimer's Program. Um, you know, to, to state it like it is, there's certainly pushback from the mainstream in terms of what you're doing, especially now that what you're doing is proving successful. How do you handle that? What is it like to have such an aggressive you know, response from mainstream medicine? Yeah, you know, and I think, I think you said it very well in the, in the forward to the book. Um, so th this is uh, something where just yesterday I was on a call uh, for a task force for our state that is trying to reduce uh, the burden of dementia in California. Uh, and, and, and here they've got the little actionables and printout, and the printout says, you know, there is nothing that we can do currently for Alzheimer's disease. And of course, I completely disagree with that. We're seeing it all the time. 
Uh, and yet, you know, in, in the uh, in, in the uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, a diplomatic approach, um, there's not much to be said other than here are the patients. So as you know, we're continuing to publish. We've now published an additional hundred. Uh, we've, we're actually writing up additional ones right now. We're also now taking this approach and looking at the unique biochemistry of each of the degenerative diseases. And so we have something called the ARC project, just as the ARC was, you know, two by two by two. Um, this is small numbers of people. So we're beginning to look at people who have macular degeneration, beginning to look at people who have Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, and others, because each of those, of course, has its own unique genetics, its own unique biochemistry. And so uh, they should each be approachable with this integrative medicine approach where you're now looking at each of the things that contributes to that mismatch. Well, you know, you, you mentioned these, uh, these markers, et cetera, that, that you look at, uh, biomarkers. And, you know, the mainstream understanding of Alzheimer's, it's basically an accumulation of a protein in the brain, beta amyloid. So why would you consider looking at other biomarkers, whether it's thyroid, blood sugar, or toxic issues. Why don't you just maybe walk through some of the, what are the common biomarkers that are so important and why? You know, that, that is such a good point because it really gets to the crux of the matter here. Everybody is trying to focus on a, quote, misfolded protein, whether you're focused on amyloid, as you mentioned, whether you're focused on tau or phosphotau, everybody's focusing on these things. These are mediators. These are part of the pathophysiology. This is no different than if you had someone with leprosy um, and you did a biopsy and you said, oh, there's some inflammation. If we can just get rid of that inflammation, everything should be fine. Well, no, there's an organism at the center of this inflammation. And this is no different with Alzheimer's. And by the way, all of the epidemiology, all of the biochemistry is converging on exactly the model that published in the earlier book. Because what's happening is people are finding, oh, herpes simplex, there it is. You can even take now, as you know, three-dimensional cultures of brain cells, infect them with herpes, and literally within days, you see the same sorts of changes. Interestingly, you have too high of a multiplicity of the infection, of course, you just have damage. But if you have a very low multiplicity of infection, what happens is you have an innate immune response, which includes a beta, which includes tau. It's the same sort of thing. So again, what we're- Let me, let me break that down for just a moment, because I think just for our, our viewers, listeners, uh, that what you're saying is that this beta amyloid protein that is so associated with Alzheimer's, I mean, obviously this, the, sort, the, uh, the focus of so much research what you've just described is that it is a response in some way as an antimicrobial that this beta amyloid seems to be responding to low-grade infections within the brain. So therefore, it has an upside. That is exactly right. And so if you're going to try to remove it, as of course these many antibodies as drugs have attempted to do, you want to remove the drivers first. And of course, so the first key is you got to look upstream. The second key is it's typically more than one contributor. So this old idea we have that, oh, I got this because the pneumococcus gave me a pneumonia. In the case of Alzheimer's, it's many different things, as you know. So therefore, you mentioned biomarkers. We want to know what your inflammatory status is. A beta is really part of the innate immune system. It is telling you you've got this ongoing innate system. And one of the interesting things, of course, normally the innate system will hand off to the adaptive system, which will then clear the pathogen and turn off the innate immune system. If there's a disconnection, which there appears to be in Alzheimer's disease, so you've got this ongoing innate response, a poor adaptive response. And one of the things in between, of course, is phagocytosis for antigen presentation. Guess what lowers phagocytosis? Low omega-3s, low vitamin D, all the things we've talked about that, that you can see have impacts on this process. So in fact, in the Alzheimer's brain, you have this poor handoff to the adaptive system, you have a poor turnoff, and you've got this years ongoing of the innate system. So as I mentioned, uh, various pathogens, uh, inflammatory things, uh, glycotoxicity, 
insulin resistance, uh, reduced levels of many different growth factors such as BDNF and NGF, hormones such as estradiol and, and androgen, uh, and then nutrients, B12, vitamin D, things like this all critical to make this system work appropriately. And then in the first book, we talked about three different types of Alzheimer's. We now know that there are different ones as well. There is a vascular form, which is type four. There is a traumatic form, type five. So there are really six, if you include the glycotoxic form, different kinds that we can identify, and therefore we can subtype each person and say, okay, these are the main things. Even though it's more than one, typically there are five to 10 critical features that are contributing to each person's. And so, you know, this is really the beginning of a change in the way we think about and prevent and improve this disease. And we're seeing it again, and there are thousands of people now who are on this protocol, and we just continue uh, on an almost daily basis to hear these wonderful stories. Actually, I just I got one uh, this morning from Dr. Toops, who's right here in the East Bay. Uh, you know, wonderful sustained improvement from MOCA of 22 up to MOCA 30 repeated. Well, I think you should tell our viewers what that means. So MOCA. the Montreal, right. So Montreal Cognitive Assessment, uh, which is uh, really about uh, looking, it's a, it's a zero to 30 uh, scale. Um, and the good thing about the, the MOCA test is that it samples different regions of the brain. So it looks at your executive function and it looks at your memory and it looks at your reading ability and it looks at your naming ability. Um, and it looks at your three dimensional uh, ability, your visual perception, all of these things. Good sampling for temporal lobe, for parietal lobe, for frontal lobe, etc. And typically, we should all be in the 28 to 30 range. 30 is a perfect score. When you start dropping below that, 27, 26, and especially down into the low 20s, you have mild cognitive impairment. You have MCI. And when you're dropping into the teens, you typically have full-blown Alzheimer's disease. So here's a person who had fairly significant MCI on the precipice of Alzheimer's who's now scoring perfectly 30 uh, doing very, very well and sustaining that. I think that's the most important thing that people... Let me sustain. put this into context. Uh, in almost 100% of patients with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, their MOCA scores decline with time. It is a given, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. In terms of mainstream medicine, there is nothing that uh, we can offer patients, be it cholinesterase inhibitors or memantine, uh, that is effective in slowing that progression. As a matter of fact, work from uh, Dr. Kennedy published last year in JAMA Network actually demonstrated that using the cholinesterase drugs inhibitors and memantine was associated with a, a hastening of the decline, a, a more rapid decline. So what you're saying is the fact that your patients uh, are stabilizing their scores and in fact improving their scores is, may I say, revolutionary. Very excited to see this. And, and as you know, we're now uh, getting toward the end of the first trial in history. So this will finish up in December. So this is the first clinical trial in history in which instead of predetermining a treatment, so you say ahead of time, we're going to give you cholinesterase inhibitor, we're going to give you an antibody to amyloid or what have you. We're not predetermining. We're saying we're going to treat what's causing the problem. So for each of these people, then they, they are looked, and this is with Dr. Kat Toops, and this is with uh, Dr. Ann Hathaway and Dr. Deborah Gordon, just all fantastic integrative physicians. Uh, and they're looking at dozens and dozens of different variables to look at what are potential toxins driving this problem? What are potential metabolic changes? What are potential inflammatory changes, pathogens, on and on? And then addressing those specific things. So we're very excited that that'll be hopefully published next year and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I think that that is the way of the future. The idea about predetermining a cause for this disease really doesn't make any scientific sense. Well, when you look at the brains of an Alzheimer's uh, patient, by and large, either post-mortem or, or nowadays using sophisticated types of brain scans, we see an accumulation of what we mentioned earlier, this beta amyloid. And uh, it, it has been uh, adopted for many years, this so-called amyloid hypothesis that this is the proximate cause of this disease, uh, despite the fact that uh, drugs targeting beta amyloid have across the board failed many times, actually making people decline more rapidly, which is what you would expect if you get rid 
of something that seems to be designed to rid our brains of, of microbes. Uh, Biogen, even this year, uh, had uh, announced another failed trial, and uh, there was another, uh, solamazumab uh, was actually, after a five-year trial, found to be ineffective as well. So um, what is it going to take to get people away from this notion that you know, we're the smoke here is what needs to be treated as opposed to the fire. Yeah, well, as you know, anytime you have a real change in direction, uh, you kind of go through those three phases where, uh, you know, people deny it uh, and then, then they get very angry. And that's the phase we're in now. People are literally angry about this. You know, how dare you say that the amyloid hypothesis is wrong? And yet, you know, it's been proven time and time again. Uh, and then ultimately, the, the response is, oh, we knew this all along. <laughs> and I think, you know, in a few years, we're headed for this where we all we all knew this all along. And it's, it's self-evident. We should have known. self-evident. We all going to do this. But I do think that, uh, you know, as more and more gets published, uh, there are other groups that are beginning to do this sort of thing. I do think we'll all kind of enter a phase where we'll kind of accept that this is the approach. And what we have to do is continue to improve it, of course. This is not a perfect approach yet. Uh, it is a first approach that's helpful, but we're now actually coming out with uh, training for so-called Recode 2.0. Um, this is the next uh, the, you know, the next iteration of this, and I think you know we'll continue to get better and better with this as we go along. And also encouraging people to get in as early as possible. People should either get on prevention. Uh, which is the best. We encourage everyone 45 years of age or older, get on prevention because this is such a common problem. About 15% of the population uh, will die from Alzheimer's, as you know. Um, and if you don't get on prevention, then please get in as early as possible. So many people wait and wait and wait and just say, oh, the senior moment or two. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's not the way to go. You don't want to wait till it's like you want to get in as, as early as possible. Well, it seems to me that even in this day and age, there is no mentioning of the term prevention and Alzheimer's in the same sentence. Uh, you know, it, by and large, uh, it's come what may, live your life come what may, and then suddenly when you're cognitively impaired, you reach for a magic drug which doesn't exist. And I think the most important lesson that you, you provide is that there are things that those of us who are not experiencing cognitive decline can do to preserve our brains. What you're doing from an interventional perspective and pe with people having established disease is phenomenal as well. But, you know, prevention, uh, as the Nei Jing, the Yellow Emperor in, in the fourth century BC, stated that prevention is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure a disease after it has manifests, it manifests is like digging a well when one feels thirsty or forging weapons when the war has already begun. So, you know, everything that you're talking about, getting back to our discussion on biomarkers, like blood sugar, for example, like uh, these dementogens or toxins that we could be exposed to, you know, as we become, become aware of that, um, there is really a lot of actionable uh, information there that we can incorporate into our lifestyles net today so that we don't have to be hoping for some magic cure when we're uh, a little bit later on in the game. Having said that, when should people begin thinking about an Alzheimer's prevention program? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we recommend that everyone who's 45 years of age or older get on a prevention program. And again, this is no different than we, you know, we all know that when we turn 50, we should have a colonoscopy. So we recommend that everyone who's 45 years of age or older have a cognoscopy. And the reason we say that is because it, it, this, as you know, this used to be thought of as a disease of your 60s, 70s, and 80s. Well, it turns out, as you know, the pathophysiology starts 20 years before that. So this really is a disease of middle age. This is a disease of your 40s, 50s, and 60s that has a major manifestation of dementia down the road. But you want to get in as early as possible. And as you have pointed out in the past, even looking at things like where your fasting glucose is, um, that is predictive of brain atrophy. Homocysteine, another great example, predictive of gray matter volume, of hippocampal volume. So this is ongoing in your 40s. Now, some people have uh, strong family histories, and for those people, you may even want to get in a little earlier than that. But for virtually all of us, 45 or, uh, you know, if you're past that, 
jump in now, get in uh, onto prevention. And the critical piece is people have said, well, you know, just, you know, eat right and exercise, you'll be fine. Well, for many people, that is true. But what we really want to know is what are your risk factors? You know, th this is the good news. Now we can measure those risk factors. And so we actually have come out with something called pre-code, prevention of cognitive decline to complement recode, which is reversal of cognitive decline. And in pre-code, we look at a set of variables. And so when you're doing prevention, it doesn't have to be quite so many, but you look at a set of variables and you can say to people, are you at risk for type 1 inflammatory, type 1.5 glycotoxic, type 2 atrophic, toxic, etc.? So we can really give you a prevention program that is targeted to your specific factors that are placing you at risk. Well, let me, uh, you know, the, the idea of, the, of knowing this information, of understanding biomarkers, you know, getting back to some previous uh, research, uh, one study looked at what was called an inflammatory index, and it was uh, the, the blood was drawn, I think, probably 30 years ago, and then the study was published probably around five years ago. And those were a, a panel of things like von Willebrand's factor, total white blood cell count, uh, several other that uh, fibrinogen level, several yeah. other that we don't really use as much today. I think today we'd be more interested in tumor necrosis, necrosis factor alpha, IL-6, CRP, et cetera. But nonetheless, they followed these people for 20 years and found that those people who initially in their 30s and 40s had elevation of this inflammation index we're at much greater risk for shrinkage of their brain, if you will. So that's, uh, you know, it, it's so important people get this understanding that you can measure your risk today, even while you're still cognitively intact in terms of what tomorrow will bring. Let me say one other thing, I, and that is I, I was asked this exact question, when we should be intervening uh, this morning on an interview. Uh, I said, well, when should we start? Uh, that was the question. I said, well, you know, maybe it's in our, our 30s, we should begin paying attention. But, you know, when we see obesity and diabetes in teenagers yeah. uh, that will likely uh, per persevere uh, in their 20s and 30s, when we see it in children, you know, we don't call it uh, adult onset diabetes anymore for a reason. Right. We know that early life microbiome plays a role in terms of inflammation. And we know, we know that our intrauterine experience also plays a role in the formation of our microbiome once we're born. So I, I believe that uh, we should really think about how we treat our developing uh, fetus in terms of guaranteeing or, or, or hoping to offset risk for Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, the chronic degenerative conditions never too early to start. So, uh, you know, these mechanisms get, get put into play and they're kind of hard to unwind. But as you so eloquently described, you absolutely can unwind them. And I think one take home message from uh, both of these books is that it's never too late. Right. And actually, you know, I, I, I got a complaining letter from someone who said, uh, you're telling people that they should get in early. He said, but in fact, my wife had a MOCA score of zero and she's done very well. So I had, okay, great. You know, we have seen a number of people. It's just that, the, as you know, the, the later it is, the harder it is, and you, the more you have to do to get a successful outcome. Nevertheless, you're absolutely right. We've seen a number of people who improve their MOCA scores from zero. And although that's they don't typically go back to 30, but what happens is they begin to speak again and they begin to dress themselves again and they begin to actually get on their emails again and things like that. So we do see some, some wonderful examples. So yes, uh, again, I would encourage people to get in as early as possible. But you know, you brought up the issues of things like insulin resistance and, and type 2 diabetes and things. And, you know, we're seeing this. This has been brought into relief by COVID-19. Just what we're seeing in Alzheimer's with two decades has been now pushed into, compressed into two weeks with COVID-19. You know, it is the changes. It is the uh, hypovitaminosis D. It is the obesity. It is the type 2 diabetes. It is the chronic illness that is increasing risk for COVID-19 poor outcome as it is increasing the risk for neurodegeneration. And the important part of that is lifestyle choices make all the difference. That's the, what's being lost 
I think in the Alzheimer's discussion, the COVID-19 discussion is that these things you mentioned, insulin resistance, obesity, et cetera, are, ref are reflection of the choices that we make. So, you know, diet, lifestyle, really important. That said, you talk about this KetoFlex program. Uh, right. I think it's KetoFlex 12.3. Uh, right. if, if you can, uh, let's talk about what that program means, but also why in the first place more of a ketogenic diet. Yeah, that's a great point, and this comes up all the time. So the issue is, how do you design a, a, a way to trigger the appropriate biochemistry that supports your synapses, allows you to rebuild synapses? Because as you know, what the, what the research showed us over 30 years is that this is essentially a disease of synaptoporosis. You're on the wrong side of the balance between synaptoblastic, making synapses and keeping synapses, and synaptoclastic, pulling apart. You know, we're act, all actively forgetting the seven song that played on the radio on the way to work yesterday. This is a balance, and you're on the wrong side of that balance. So if you were to design the best biochemistry to support this, what you would want, number one, you need energy to drive that synapse formation. And as you know, everybody with Alzheimer's, if you look at their PET scans, they are not utilizing glucose appropriately in the temporal and parietal regions and specifically, you know, the posterior cingulate and precuneus, but specific regions of the brain, you're not utilizing glucose appropriately. So ketones actually help you to bridge that gap. It's been seen many times. Of course, Mary Newport has pointed this out many times. Stephen Kinane, others have pointed out. This is a great way to bridge that gap. And we see it in people. Now that we have thousands of people who are doing this, the ones who are getting good ketone levels between one and four millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate tend to do the best. And it's not always that way, but they tend to do the best. And the ones who are down at 0 0.2, 0 0.3 tend to do the worst. So the first thing is you want to drive yourself into a mildly ketotic state. It actually helps your brain. Secondly, you want to have a plant-rich diet, as you have pointed out over the years many, many times. Thirdly, we want to, just as you said in Grain Brain, you know, we want to avoid gluten. We want to avoid dairy. These are the things that are actually damaging synapses. These are the things that are creating the very inflammation that is being responded to with amyloid. So it's keto and then it's flex. You know, you can, if you want to have some meat, some fish, that's great. You know, have some uh, grass-fed beef, have some pastured chicken. Um, I, I, one of the things I've been doing during COVID is using chronometer very carefully on myself each day to find out what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong and to find it very helpful. And so you want to drive people with a plant-rich diet. Um, you can be vegetarian if you want. You don't have to be if you don't want, as long as you follow your numbers. Be careful if you're a vegan. You just want to make sure that your homocysteine doesn't go too high. Your B12 and vitamin D don't go too low, but you can do it very successfully there. And for people who have a vascular component, it's not a bad idea. Uh, and then you want to have the 12 and 3. So you want to have a minimum of 12 hours between finishing dinner and starting breakfast, brunch, or lunch the next day. Uh, where you've got that fast because the fast is so critical for a number of things, for supporting the ketosis, for supporting autophagy, uh, for improving insulin sensitivity, all these things. Fasting turns out to be such a, such a powerful part of the treatment. Uh, and then, uh, so 12 hours, and then you want three hours at least before bed. You don't, as you know, you don't want to eat right up until you go to bed. A bad idea keeps your insulin high when you're sleeping, keeps your you know, melatonin low, all the wrong things if you're eating right up until bedtime. So that's the basis of the KetoFlex 12-3 approach. And then we pair that with exercise, stress reduction, and sleep. And one of the things that's come out of this is sleep is a huge issue because we have so many people who have undiagnosed nocturnal oxygen desaturation. So their oxygenation is dropping down into the 80s or even 70s while they're sleeping. And that is associated. In fact, as you know, a really interesting paper came out showing that simply tracking the mean SpO2 as you sleep tracks, it correlates beautifully with multiple volumetric regions on your brain, in your on your MRI. So as your oxygen goes down as you sleep, your brain shrinks. 
Well, and we know that disrupted sleep is also, uh, or non-restorative sleep is a powerful risk factor for so many of the other uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's, whether it's weight gain, uh, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, coronary artery disease, all of those uh, issues that then secondarily will increase, uh, increase the risk. Um, I'd like to get back to the, uh, the COVID discussion because I think it's, there's a really interesting parallel here between uh, lifestyle choice and again, this outcome of COVID and how incredible it is that uh, we are seeing this relationship to Alzheimer's uh, and other degenerative uh, problems. One wonders if a more ketogenic diet these days uh, might be an appropriate choice uh, in terms of immune balancing, enhancing autophagy, uh, a, a form of senolytic therapy, as we've talked about in other uh, venues, and if that might not be something people should at least give consideration to. Yeah, that's a very good point. And as you know, there's more and more interest in supporting immune system. As I mentioned earlier, just making sure you've got the appropriate omega-3s and appropriate vitamin D so that you can actually do appropriate antigen presentation is important for triggering your adaptive response. You don't want that. And again, just what you talk about in, in Alzheimer's, you see it with COVID-19. These are people who are dying from cytokine storm. This is part of innate immune system activation with inefficient clearance on the adaptive side. So that's why you want to have appropriate zinc levels and appropriate vitamin D levels. And um, I've, I've been taking AHCC because it is very good for uh, activating your CD4 uh, helper cells. You want to have that support, especially when you're you know out there. Uh, and I should say, as an aside, one of the things that's come up again and again is simply being outside. It turns out that COVID-19 spreads it's mostly indoors. It is when you get in groups of people, and it's in the ducts, and it's in the air conditioning, and it's in everything indoors. And as pointed out, six feet is not nearly enough indoors. It's, it's the stuff is everywhere. Whereas when you're outdoors, you've got that dissipative environment. And that, you know, the same thing for, that's where the indoors is where the Legionnaires is. It's where the tuberculosis is. It's, by the way, where all the mycotoxins are. Uh, we're all living in mold food, unfortunately. It's really turning out that people were not meant to be indoors all the time. This is a huge issue. So as you say, COVID-19 is just bringing up the fact that we all need to be immune supported. And as our, our friend and colleague, Jeff Bland, has pointed out, we also want to prevent immune senescence. Uh, and so obviously he's, he's working hard on that. Very exciting stuff. You mentioned senolytics, same ideas, things like quercetin uh, that have been used so beautifully to prevent those associated problems with senescent cells. But then again, uh, more of a ketogenic diet or fasting, fasting right. per se, uh, might well be something everyone could do under their doctor's supervision. We always have to say that. Yeah. Uh, that really helps jumpstart this whole process of autophagy and acts as a powerful a senolytic approach. Absolutely. And I think a lot of you know, people have been developing senolytic drugs. I think what's going to be found, as with all these other things, you do the appropriate lifestyle things, you do the appropriate basics, you're going to get that senolytic process. You don't necessarily have to take a drug that's going to have side effects. Right. Well, I mean, what... Uh fasting and getting outside, getting a good night's sleep, what side effects might we have? Probably only upsides. I would uh, ask our viewers if you're interested. I had a very interesting interview with Dr. Matthew Phillips from uh, New Zealand that's posted on the site where we talked about uh, his consideration for the role of fasting in neurological problems. As many of you know, he wrote a very interesting paper on the role of the ketogenic diet uh, in Parkinson's disease, so something you might want to look at. So um, you talk in your book about dementogens. So yes. these are things, obviously, if they generate dementia, dementogens, we want to avoid. Maybe give us a couple of common examples and, and tell us what we can do to live a more um, Alzheimer's reduced risk kind of life. Yeah, it's a very good point. And I have to say, I have been shy. I would say this is the thing that surprised me the most. Uh, our research had suggested that there's this balance that I mentioned earlier and that things like trophic reductions were going to impact this balance. We did not know initially 
uh, about dementogens until we had people who weren't responding to changes in hormones and trophic balance and metabolism and things like that. And it turned out that these people had very significant toxic associations. So it's turned out these things are basically, it's three groups of them. So it's the metals and other inorganics, things like air pollution, very common, and especially mercury. This comes up fairly often, as you know, both organic and inorganic mercury. And then it's the organics. Um, and just recent examples, um, people with acrolein toxicity, um, which you can get a number of ways. Acrolein is just, uh, part, uh, part of herbicides. You can get it from that. Um, you can get it from fried foods. You can get it from incompletely combusted gasoline. One of the people uh, actually liked to drive a hot car and, and was always exposed to these incompletely combusted products. Um, uh, another one, uh, uh, propylene oxide. Uh, another one, and, and on and on. It's toluene, it's benzene, uh, all these sorts of things, formaldehyde. These things tax our detox systems, as you know. Uh, you mentioned earlier, going back to even uh, to, to, uh, uh, you know, to the embryonic period. Um, and in fact, I think the whole concept of pre-gestational planning um, with reduction in toxicity is such a good idea. And of course, Dr. Pizzorno, Dr. Genuis, uh, Dr. Stone, all these people have talked repeatedly about the importance of preconception planning and getting the toxins out. So basically, it's the metals and organics, it's the organics. And then, of course, maybe the most important ones of all are the biotoxins. Um, and, you know, again, unfortunately, we've all chosen to build our homes largely out of mold food and the molds just love them. we get you know a little bit of rain in there we get a little leak and the molds flourish and of course it's not all molds that make the mycotoxins but especially the stachybotrys penicillium aspergillus ketomium wallemia those are the the big ones uh, and they of course make these toxins that damage the nervous system that damage the immune system that can be carcinogenic as well and so many people don't realize that they are exposed to these over the years. And you know, so often what we'll have is one of the parents will get Alzheimer's, another parent uh, may have lung disease, and then one of the children uh, may have ADHD or autism. Um, these, these toxins are affecting multiple members of the family. And unless you look for them, and unless you get rid of them, people don't get better. They keep their, their high risk. So the, the exciting part is to see people who do have high levels who now are, who are getting rid of these and actually now turning the corner and improving their cognition. This is the toughest type of Alzheimer's to treat successfully, but with people uh, doing the right thing, we're seeing improvements again and again. It's a bit of a segue to, uh, for us down in Florida, who uh, people are beginning to make some uh, correlations between uh, things that are outgassed from red tide, for example, and yes. neurodegenerative conditions, both ALS and Alzheimer's. And I was reading uh, uh, a, a, just a general magazine article about that, and I noted that they quoted you. So any update? I guess it's BMAA that you could, that you could give us? Yeah, you know, there, so there's not a simple clinical way to measure BMAA. You mentioned, uh, you know, Paul Cox has done, done all this nice work over the years on BMAA originally with fruit bats uh, and then the Guamanian uh, Parkinson's dementia. Alzheimer's dementia, yeah. I Absolutely. mean, dementia complex. Yeah, absolutely. And so looking at, you know, is L-serine going to be a way to go? And others have brought this up for other reasons because it also has impacts at the NMDA receptor in the brain. We'll see. The concern is that you have both excitotoxic or I should say excitoagonistic effects, as well as preventive effects. You, but you bring up a really good point. Um, things like BMAA, which, does, which triggers this excitotoxicity, and another big one, glyphosate, turning out to be, we're seeing it again and again in people with either ALS, uh, or in people with Parkinson's. And, and Dr. Shen Hong Lu has mentioned this repeatedly and has seen patients who have really very little else in terms of risk factors, but will come in relatively young ages, in their 40s typically, um, with ALS and turn out only have one thing that you can find, which is very, very high levels of glyphosate, of course, which you know we are all exposed. So again, having your detox uh, appropriate, doing the appropriate 
sweating, you know, the filtered water, all high fiber diets, all of these things are helpful for basic detox and something that we all need to be thinking about because we are at risk. And unfortunately, these things sneak up on you. And as you mentioned, you end up having a syndrome where you have no idea where it came from. And suddenly the doctor is telling you, you have a terminal illness. Hmm. Let me shift gears a little bit because uh, I think it's kind of important and not talked about that much. And you, you uh, spend quite a bit of time in uh, the book talking about oral health. Yes. and its relationship to brain degeneration. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, and that's been another surprise. I mentioned earlier the, the nocturnal oxygen desaturation um, and then the dementogens as well. And yes, oral health is turning out to be, for many people, uh, an important contributor to cognitive decline. And you look at, you know, what do you find in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's? You find herpes simplex from the lip. You find various pathogens such as P. gingivalis, T. denticola, F. nucleatum, all from the oral microbiome in the brain. So these things gain access to the brain. You find fungi from the sinuses. So you've got a real uh, area of concern here. This is a danger zone where things are now invading your brain. And in fact, as you know, there's a group focusing just on inhibiting the gingipane, one specific protease of P. gingivalis. And there's an ongoing trial for this. We'll see. Uh, my concern, again, is it's, it's one of many contributors as opposed to the only contributor. But we'll see. We do need ways to deal with all of these things. But it starts with prevention. It starts with appropriate oral health. And that includes things like simply using dental side and toothpaste occasionally, uh, dental side and mouthwash available. This is a biocidin that is supportive of the good bacteria um, and inhibits the bad bacteria. It starts with things like if you've got a number of mercury amalgams, dental amalgams, to get those uh, out appropriately with a biological dentist. It starts with uh, using appropriate water flossing to make sure that you don't have gingivitis or periodontitis. These things that we've all thought, you know, this is part of normal life. In fact, these are all part of the contributors and the concerns for risk for cognitive decline. Well, I'm just say to our viewers, what I have found helpful that always take home points is they now make it's like a water pick, but it's rechargeable. You fill the reservoir, you could use it in the shower, so you don't have to lean over the sink and all that stuff. I, you know, I think back about uh, 17 years ago, Dr. Ruth Itzaki uh, over in England had published some really groundbreaking uh, work, again, I think first to, to identify herpes simplex virus in its proximity to beta amyloid, showing that antibodies directed post-mortem against herpes simplex virus type 1 co-localized with beta amyloid. And it was the beginning of this hypothesis that there may be a causative role uh, of herpes simplex uh, in Alzheimer's. Of course, everybody jumped upon it just like they did on uh, P. gingivalis uh, as the cause. Everybody wants it to be uh, you know, to find the single Newtonian billiard ball that is causing this issue. I think if we learn nothing else from you, it's that we've got to embrace the idea that uh, there are many ways to jump on the carousel here. And therefore, we have to consider uh, that there needs to be multiple interventions across a wide spectrum if we're going to jump off this carousel and resume our lives. That's a really good point. And you know, this comes back to solving difficult problems. Often you have to change the frame of reference. You can't look at it with your standard Cartesian. Maybe, you know, maybe you've got to change it here. Maybe you've got to look at it with the you know, radial coordinates, et cetera. But the point here is that the center of this is not, there doesn't seem to be one virus or one fungus or one bacterium or one spirochete. The center of this is the signaling that is synaptoblastic and synaptoclastic, and you are looking at a change in that signaling. And there are many pathways to change that signaling. And as you said, Dr. Itzaki has been looking at this for many years. And again, the amyloid is, you can think of it a little bit like capturing insects in amber. This amyloid that we're putting out engulfs these things and protects it. And by the way, you know, the, the bees in their hive use something called propolis. 
And propolis is a little bit like amyloid. They coat things. So if a, you know, if a rat gets into a beehive and dies, they coat this rat because it's antimicrobial it's, and it's an interesting an anti-inflammatory and an antimicrobial with propolis, which they make from bark of various trees. This isn't what amyloid is like. You are coating herpes, you're coating P. gingivalis, you're coating Borrelia, you're coating these various things in a protective coat. And you're getting this phenomenon, which is saying, okay, I, I am responding to the long-term presence of these organisms. So, of course, we want to clean that out over time, but you can't do that as long as you're on the wrong side of that balance, as long as you've got re-exposure, as long as you've got a poor ability, no energetics to accomplish this, you can't get rid of this. I wrote a paper about this many, many years ago, and I characterized beta amyloid by saying, based on what you just said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. Yeah, and, and all this, uh, all this, you know, uh, all the hundreds of millions of dollars directed at getting rid of our friend have made, you know, by and large, made people worse because now we lose that ability to obstinize or to uh, create a scenario whereby these invaders can be identified as such, and we can rid ourselves of them. Vitamin D enhances catholicidin D, another antimicrobial, pe antimicrobial peptide. So that's might well explain why there is such a strong correlation between not only Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other neurodegenerative conditions, MS, uh, and um, low levels of vitamin D. I know that's a central part of your program. It's a very good point. And you know, a few years ago, uh, Professor Kachang Yi, who's at Emory, a wonderful colleague who who showed that there, the APP, the, the precursor for the amyloid, has yet another protease that had been unrecognized, delta secretase. And guess what? It's part of the innate immune system. So again, this all comes back to you're fighting things that are insults. And so, sure, we'd love to get rid of amyloid, but what we really want to do is we want to get rid of the stuff that's causing you to have to make amyloid, as opposed to just cleaning out the amyloid, and now you're exposed to all these insults without your protection. Yeah, it's like we're, we're, uh, we're getting rid of the fire extinguishers when we, get, when we try to get rid of beta amyloid, and we should ask ourselves, well, why are they going off in the first place? What is the trigger? I think abundantly clear in your work is that that trigger can be a multitude of things, and that targeting one thing is beyond myopic. And this is, you know, this is 21st century medicine. You know, we as physicians have over the millennia looked for simple treatments and simple causes, but we're in an era now where we have the ability to look at many different pieces, and that's the way physiology actually works. Human beings are very complicated, and the idea that there's going to be just one thing that's causing these complex chronic illnesses has simply proven to be wrong. Unfortunately, we did get rid of things like pneumococcal pneumonia that were simple, but now the things that are affecting us from Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases to cancer to osteoporosis, all these things, these are complex chronic illnesses, and it really is going to take uh, our ability to look at larger data sets to be able to do this. And, you know, we're, Google knows where you're shopping, David. And so, uh, you know, the, there's so much now, so much that is used for very complex uh, calculations. Why not use the same sort of thing for helping our health, especially our brain health? Well, that brings up the notion of personalized medicine. If Google knows where I'm shopping, they know how to target me. Yeah. So many times I'm asked, well, what are the supplements I should be taking to prove uh, prevent Alzheimer's or to take care of my brain. But you, I think, in, in the book, don't really uh, address that in favor of the idea that people need speci specific nutritional supplement recommendations based upon their lab work, based upon their needs, based upon their genetics, based upon their type of dementia that they have. That's exactly right. And there is a chapter discussing that very thing and looking at it from the 
from the need standpoint, you know, how do I improve my homocysteine? How do I improve my BDNF? How do I improve my, you know, my uh, synaptic transmission, uh, you know, with uh, magnesium, et cetera? So yes, uh, there's no reason to be taking magnesium if you have a lot of magnesium. As you know, there have been problems with people whose vitamin D was too high. You can get into problems there. <clears throat> problems with too much uh, vitamin E, on and on. So you want to target <clears throat> the actual cause of the problem. And yes, many of us are deficient in vitamin D, in zinc, in magnesium, in iodine. These are some of the most common deficiencies that we have. But you'd like to know that what you're doing is the right thing, as opposed to just taking these things blindly. It'll give you a much better overall effect. And of course, we have to re remember, supplements are supplementary by definition. So we do go through, you know, here's when to take this and here's when to take that. A question that I'm asked frequently, and I would like your uh, views on it. Now, we're hearing a lot, you know, in, in social media, for example, now that everybody's getting genetic testing, about the so-called MTHFR. Is right. that a disease? Ha I have MTHFR, or, you know, the idea that what is a polymorphism in a couple of gene areas uh, may actually compromise our ability to go through this methylation pathway, we may raise our homocysteine level, et cetera. Uh, is that kind of an integral part of your genetic screening of individuals? So we, yeah, and we do look, and there's more and more that can be done. I mean, certainly getting a whole genome is now a very affordable. Uh, it's, you know, you can do this now for several hundred dollars, whereas the very first one, uh, you know, ended up being a few billion dollars to actually uh, finish the genome. So it's, it's getting easier and easier to do that. Um, but yes, you, you certainly want to know some basics. And I think one of the most important, uh, of course, APOE, we talk about all the time, APOE4, you want to know your status there. And there are all sorts of things you can do about it, despite the fact that everyone's told us that there's nothing you can do. There's a tremendous amount that you can do. The armamentarium for this, for cognitive decline, is large. Second thing, you want to know whether you have null alleles in some of the critical detox apparatus. And so things like glutathione S-transferase, glutathione peroxidase. There are many people walking around with nulls, so they literally don't have the gene. And so they feel fine, but their detox is not very good. Helpful to know that. As you indicated, methylation status. So things like uh, your MTHFR, very important. So you want to know the usual, you know, C677T uh, and, you know, A1098. Uh, Which I have both of. <laughs> okay, and, that's, and that's common. So all that really means is that your MTHFR is a little more thermolabile than someone else's. If you've got both of those, you've still got, if you've got your homozygous or heterozygous? I'm homozygous for both. For both. Okay. So you have something like 20% of the methylation. It's not zero. Um, you have thermolabile. Um, I'm sure you probably know this better than I do. Um, and so the good news is, fine, there's a lot you can do about it. And of course, starting with things like getting appropriate, uh, you know, P5P, uh, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, getting appropriate uh, methyl uh, folate, getting appropriate methyl cobalamin, all these things, and drive your, uh, you know, homocysteine down, which is a good marker. You're also dealing with your toxins better. I'm sure you're doing many things right with respect to toxin, uh, you know, toxin exposure. So the good news is we can use the genetics to tell us ahead of time what we should be focusing on and give ourselves a head start so we don't have to wait for symptoms. So we do mention this in the book. And of course, COMT is another good one to know um, because that, may, uh, that impacts what form of cobalamin you take. So on and on, there are all sorts of good things that, will, that, that you can know from your uh, genetics. I would just for our viewers uh, ask you to look at the interview I did with Dr. Sharon Houseman Cohen, yeah. uh, where she walks through why this is all important, how to get it done, and uh, you know what are the implications. But most importantly, as we just heard from you, uh, what do you do about it? You know, knowing this stuff is great, but more importantly, okay, now that I know it, what can I do to kind of offload the risk that might have otherwise been imparted on me by virtue of these my genetic uniqueness or a person's genetic uniqueness. Um, let me uh, ask you, if I could, before we close, 
Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the so-called gut-brain connection. Yeah. And you talk about the gut bacteria, but beyond that, so what you call the holobiome. In other mm -hmm. words, the, the representation of microorganisms, not only in the gut, but really throughout the body, in the nose, on the skin, et cetera. How influential is the holobiome, uh, and including the gut bacteria, on brain health? Well, of course, uh, we don't know yet, but there's more and more coming out that shows how critical it is. <clears throat> not only the gut, also the oral microbiome, as we discussed just a few minutes ago, also your sinus microbiome, and of course, somewhat surprisingly, the brain microbiome. And it's still unclear, and of course, you've published a whole book on this, it's still unclear whether, in fact, there is a normal microbiome in the brain, or whether, in fact, the brain should be a sterile organ. We were all taught that it should be sterile in medical school. Now it's turning out that you look at the brains of patients with Alzheimer's, you see all sorts of organisms. Um, normal brains tend not to have those organisms, and yet uh, there may be normal organisms in the brain. It's still, I think, say that it's not settled yet. Uh, it's clear, though, that the old concept that you have no organisms or an infection is completely wrong. It's about the, the, the set of organisms, and that's true of the gut, that's true of the sinuses, that's true of the entire holobiome, and maybe the brain as well. And so it's not just about getting rid of the bad guys, but also about supporting the good guys. And the idea of let's just wipe out all the microbes is really not the way to go, which is you know, why you wanna be careful about things you know, like bleach and things like antibiotics, which are wiping out both the good guys and the bad guys. You want to get the right balance. And this is, again, where the dental side and uh, toothpaste uh, comes into it. Uh, and, of course, where probiotics and prebiotics that you've talked about uh, so much over the years are so critical. And we do find that so many of the people with cognitive decline do have leaky gut, do have systemic inflammation. And of course, if you actually look at the micro, the gut microbiome, it is different in Alzheimer's than it is in people without Alzheimer's. So restoring an appropriate microbiome is likely to be very important. And of course, lots of interesting work being done on this actively in Parkinson's, in Alzheimer's. I think you're gonna see this you know, in many, many different uh, diseases, you know, MS, you know, on and on. Again, it comes back to this is all an orchestra and you need to get the right players playing the right things at the right time in the right way to get optimal outcomes. But I do think this will be a critical part of treatment and prevention of cognitive decline. Well, it's sure good to spend time with you. Uh, I miss you. And, uh, you know, it's over the, any given year, we end up running into each other several times. And right now that's not happening. And it's... Uh, it's not pleasant, but we could, you know, we visit uh, virtually, and that, I guess, is okay for now. Yeah, I think they'll have to do for now. But, yeah, we miss you guys as well. So great to see you. Please say hi to Lee's, uh, uh, Austin, Raisha, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe during the pandemic. Thanks, Dale, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. What an interesting uh, experience that was, learning from Dr. Dale Bredesen, really the leader in this very integrated approach uh, to brain health, uh, actually discussing how he has been able through his program uh, and through the various people who've been trained in his program to reverse cognitive decline. So uh, what a guy, what a book, what a program. Very, very exciting. Hope you enjoyed the program today. I know that I did. That's all for now. Talk to you soon.